Recently, I made a post on Facebook, my favorite place to hang out, in support of Black Lives Matter. And almost immediately, I got a private message from a Facebook friend, a white person, who took me to task for that post. She said, that is divisive. All lives matter. And we need to stop seeing each other by color and see each other by human beings. She continued, when I look at you, Tracy, I don't see color. I see an intelligent woman, an attorney, a good person. Now, this Facebook friend paid me a nice compliment. But I have heard over and over and over, when I look at you, I don't see color. And I confess, that sounds like a really good thing, doesn't it? It sounds like just what this country needs right now, indeed the world, to focus on our shared humanity rather than something divisive like color, doesn't it? It seems like it would help us at this moment, that it's helpful, or at least benign, But is it? Or does the failure to see color form the basis of a very considerable problem in this country? So let's talk about racism for just a minute. There is ample evidence and research that racism exists in every institution in this country. It exists in our criminal justice system where people of color, particularly black men, are profiled and pulled over more often by the police, charged with more serious crimes, convicted more frequently, and sentenced more harshly than our white people. In fact, although blacks and whites use drugs at roughly the same rates, black people are six times more likely to be arrested and convicted for drug offenses. Racism exists in our health care system. I read research recently that documented that black people are sometimes mistreated for pain under the misguided notion that we have higher pain tolerances than white people. Therefore, we don't get the appropriate pain medication to manage our pain. Racism exists in our educational systems, where black children are three to four times more likely to be suspended or expelled from school than our white students for similar or same behavior, thus greasing the skids for the school-to-prison pipeline that is so prevalent in this country. Racism exists in our workplaces, where black folks are 36 percent less likely to receive a callback for a job than our white people, a stat that has not changed since 1990. And racism exists even for someone, as my Facebook friend described, an intelligent woman, an attorney, a good person. I'm reminded of a story, my story, one morning when I had to be in court. I had, it was going to be a busy morning. Two cases up, two different courthouses in two different counties. As I entered the first courtroom and stood in line to check in with the clerk, I waited my turn behind two white attorneys a white male and a white female. And when it was my turn, I stepped up and started to introduce myself and try to check my client in and check my case in. When the clerk rudely interrupted me and ordered me out of that hallowed area in the courtroom where judges and bailiffs and clerks and attorneys 
hang out. And she ordered me to go sit with the rest of the defendants in the public seating area. Now, I finished up my business at that、uh, courthouse, and I raced over to the other county, to the other courthouse, and before entering the courtroom, I stopped at the clerk's office and, to file something, and I got in line, in a line that overhead had a sign hanging that said, for attorneys only. And I waited in line behind two white men. And when it was my turn, I stepped up to the clerk's window, and she refused to wait on me because, as she said, this line is for attorneys only. Now, when I had a moment to catch my breath and was reflecting on what in the world just happened, I thought, Two different counties, two different courtrooms in two different counties, two different courthouses. And the only difference between me and the other attorneys is that they were white and I was black. I was dressed professionally, I had a case file in my hand, and I had a legal sized yellow pad. Come on, <laughs> what else screams attorney besides that legal sized yellow pad, right? You should also know the day. It was August 28, 2013, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. What a bitter irony. Ultimately, black folks know that no matter how well educated we are, no matter how articulate we are, No matter how well cultured we are, we have fundamentally different experiences in this country than white people, even if white people don't notice. That then is the problem of what I call the exceptional Negro. That is, the black person who, for white people, is unlike other black people they use as a reference point. Exceptional Negroes are well educated. They are articulate. They're well cultured. And they seemingly move effortlessly through white business, social, political circles. And most of all, exceptional Negroes know how to behave in public. Not too loud, not too aggressive. We make white people safe. And we don't fit in. Easily to the stereotypes about black people criminal, thug, welfare queen, baby mama, baby daddy, and myriad other negative stereotypes usually associated with black folks. We are safe, and therefore we are deemed exceptional. And it is that exceptionalism that allows white people, makes it easy for white people. To fail to see our color. So, when my Facebook friend told me essentially my color was irrelevant, it created a problem for me. She did not create racism, but the failure to see color obscures racism and therefore perpetuates it. The late civil rights activist Julian Bond once said, If you are blind to color, then you are blind to the consequences of color. So if you can't see color, then you don't see how systems operate in this country to the detriment of people of color because of our color. If you fail to see me as a black woman in America, then you fail really to see me. You miss all of who I am. Being black informs my perspectives. It is the lens through which I see the world. It is how I navigate every day, and it forms the basis for many of my experiences in this country. Color blindness obscures racism, systemic racism, and therefore perpetuates it. So, what do we do about this problem? How do we undo? The notion that colorblindness is a noble pursuit. How do we undo 
the damage done by color blindness, obscuring of race, systemic racism, and perpetuation of systems of oppression. So HBO came to my community recently to film a documentary on the community policing program and the relationship between the police and the community. And in preparation for coming to town for that documentary, they contacted people, and they contacted a white woman and asked her if she would be interviewed about the relationship between the community and the police and about our community policing program. Now, this white woman could have told a very lovely story of her zero interactions with the police. But instead, because she is color conscious rather than color blind, she referred the producers to me. And they called, invited me to an interview, and I was able to, to speak to some of the black community's experiences with the police, and in turn refer the, the producers to other black folks who could paint the story of black people's relationships and interactions with the police. This white woman's color consciousness led her to allow our stories to be told. Rather than speak for us, over us, or ignore us, she chose to amplify our voices and our stories. She knew that if she were to tell her story and the stories of her white friends and her white circle, that the truth could be obscured. The hard truth that in most communities in this country, there is some level of tension between the police and the black community. And to obscure that truth would perpetuate that truth. At the heart of that story is a white woman who continuously seeks to be actively curious about the experiences of black folks and people of color so that she can be an ally rather than a hindrance. And that, I think, is the key for us collectively to begin to dismantle systemic racism. We cannot attack this vicious animal called systemic racism by assuming that we are all the same, but rather by being actively curious about our differences. What does this curiosity look like? Well, it could mean that white people would actively listen to the stories of marginalized people and believe us when we tell you about our, the microaggressions and racism that we face. It could mean that you research systemic oppression, systemic racism, institutionalized racism, and educate yourselves about that. It could mean that you become actively curious about how the experiences of people of color in this country impact our lives. This is the path to thriving in the colorful communities in which we live. Rather than assume we are all the same, be actively curious about our differences. And so, I ask you, will you continue to see me as an exceptional Negro, or will you see me as black? And are you curious to discover the difference? Thank you.